Good, good afternoon. It's the Black Man Read Aloud Hour. Um, this is the Black Man Who Reads Aloud, excuse me. This is the Black Man Who Reads Aloud, Joe Hall, uh, Smoke. Uh, this is uh, my journey, the Black Man's journey through the uh, Federal Writers Project, Florida Slave Narratives. Today we are, we are visiting uh, the recollections of William Sherman uh, in 1936 in Chaseville, Florida, about 12 miles from Jacksonville, on the south side of the St. John's River, lives William Sherman, a former slave of Jack Davis, nephew of President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy. William Sherman was born on the plantation of Jack Davis, about five miles from Robeson, South Carolina, at a place called Black Swamp, June 12, 1842. 23 years prior to emancipation. His father was also named William Schumann, uh, was a free man, having brought his freedom for $1,800 from his master, John Jones, who also lived in the vicinity of the Davis Plantation. William Sherman, a senior, bargained with his master to obtain his freedom, however, for he did not have money to readily pay him, he hired him self out to some of the wealthy plantation owners and applied what he earned towards the payment for his freedom. He was a master skilled blacksmith and cabinet maker and his services were always in demand. After procuring his freedom, he brought a track of land from his former master and built a home and a blacksmith shop on it. As was the custom during slavery, a person who brought his freedom had to have a guardian. Sherman's former master, John Jones, acted as his guardian. Under, a, under this new territory, new order of things, Sherman was in reality his own master. He was not bossed, uh, had his own hours, earned and kept his money, and was at liberty to leave the territory if he desired. However, he, re he remained and married Anna Georgia, the mother of woman Sher William Sherman Jr. She was also a slave of Jack Davis. After William Sherman Sr. finished his day's work, he would go to the Davis plantation to visit his wife and sometimes remain for the night. It was his intention to purchase the freedom of his wife Anna Georgia and their son William, but he died before he had sufficient money to do so. And also before this civil war, which he had predicted would ensue between the North and the South. His son William says that he remembers well the events that led up to his father's burial. He, he states that white people dug his grave, which was six feet deep. It took them three days in which to dig it on the account of the hardness of the clay. When it was finished, he was put sorrowfully away by the white folks who thought so much of him. William was a boy of nine at the time and remembers that his mother was so grieved that she tried to console her by telling her not to worry, Papa's going to come back and bring us some more quails. He had been accustomed to bringing them quails during his life, but William softly said he never did come back. Anna George was a cook and a general housewoman in the Davis home. She was a half-breed. Her mother was a, was my mother being a Cherokee Indian, her father William was a descendant of the Chihar Indians, some of his forebearers being four-blooded Chihars. Their Indian blood was fully evident, states William Jr. The Davis family tree, as he knew it, was as follows. Three brothers, Sam Thomas and Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy. Sam was the eldest of the three and had four children. Um, Viz, Je v Visa, Jack, Robert, Richard, and Washington. Thomas had four, James, Richard, Rusha, and Mina. Jefferson Davis' family was not known to William as he lived in Virginia, whereas the o other brothers and their families lived near each other at Black Swamp. Jack Davis, the master of William Sherman, was the son of Sam Davis, brother of Jefferson Davis. Thomas and Sam Davis were comparatively large men, while Jefferson was thin and of medium height, resembling 
to a great extent the late Henry Flagler of the Florida East Coast fame states William. Many times he would come to visit his brothers at Black Swamp. He would drive up in a two-wheeled buggy drawn by his a horse. Oft times he visited his nephew Jack and they would get together in a lengthy conversation. Sometimes he would remain with the Davis family for a few days and then return to Virginia. On these visits, William states that he saw him personally. These visits or sojourns occurred prior to the Civil War. Jack Davis, being a comparatively poor man, had only eight slaves on his plantation and they were housed in log cabins made of cypress timber notched together in a way as to give it appearance of being built with regular lumber. It was much larger and of different architecture than the slave cabins, however. The few slaves that he had arose at four o'clock in the morning and prepared themselves for the field. They stopped at noon for a light lunch where they, that where they always took with, which they always took with them, and at sundown they quit work and went to their respective cabins. Cotton, corn, potatoes, and other commodities were raised. There was no regular overseer employed. Davis, the master, acted in that, in that capacity. He was very kind to them and seldom used the whip. After the outbreak of the Civil War, white men called patrollers were posted around the various plantations to guard against runaways, and if slaves were caught off their respective plantations without permits from their masters, they were severely whipped. This was not the routine for Jack Davis's slaves, for he gave the patrollers specific orders that if, if any of them were caught off the plantation without a permit, not to molest them, but to let them proceed where they were bound. Will said that one of the slaves ran away, and when he was caught, his master gave him a light whipping and told him to go on down and run away if you want to. He said the slaves walked away, but never attempted to run away. Will states that he was uh, somewhat of a pet around the plantation and did almost, almost as he wanted to. He would go hunting, fishing, swimming with his master's sons, who were about his age. Sometimes he would get into a fight with one of the boys, and many times he would be the victor. His fallen foe would sometimes exclaim, That licking that you gave me sure hurt. And that ended the affair. There was no further ill feeling between them. Education, the slaves were not allowed to study. White children studied the large blue back Webster speller, and when one had thoroughly learned his context, contents, he was considered to be educated. Religion. The slaves had their own church, but sometimes went to the churches of their white masters where they were relegated to the extreme rear. John Kelly, a white man, often preached to them and would admonish them as follows. You must obey your master and missus. You must be good niggers. After the beginning of the war, they held meetings among themselves in their cabins. Baptism. The slaves who believed and accepted the Christian doctrine were admitted into the church after being baptized in one of the surrounding ponds. Cruelties. There, were, there was a very wealthy plantation owner who lived near the Davis plantation. He had 11 plantations. The smallest one was cultivated by 300 slaves. Oft times they would work nearly all night. Will states that it was not an unusual thing to hear in the early morning the echoes of rawhide whips cracking like the report of a, uh, uh, of a, of a, of a gun against the bare backs of slaves who were being whipped. They would moan and groan in agony, but the whippings went on and, uh, until the master's wrath was appeased. John Stokes, a white plantation owner who lived near the Davis plantation, encouraged slaves to s steal from their masters and bring the stolen goods to him. He would purchase the goods for much less than their value. One time, one of the slaves put it out that Master Stokes was buying stolen goods. Stokes heard of this, and his wrath was aroused. He had come to, he had to find the nigger who was circulating this rumor. He went after him in great fury and finally succeeded in locating him, whereupon he gave him a good lacing and warned him, if you ever, if I, if, if he ever hear anything like that again from him, he was going to kill him. The accusations were true, however, but the slave des desisted in further discussion of the affair for, for old Master Stokes was a treacherous man. On another occasion, one of the Stokes slaves ran away and he sent Stephen Kettles, known as the dog man, to catch the escape. 
the dogs that went in pursuit of the runaway slaves are called nigger dogs and they were used specifically for catching runaway slaves. This particular slave had quite a head start on, on the dogs that were trailing him and he hid among some floating logs in a large pond. The dogs trailed them to the pond and began hollering, indicating that they were approaching their prey. They entered the pond to get their victim who was securely hidden from sight. They disappeared and the next scene, uh, the next scene of them was their dead bodies floating upon the water of the pond. Th they had been killed by the escape. They were four-blooded hounds such as were used in hunting escaped slaves and were about 50 in number. The slave made his escape and was never seen again. Will relates that it was very cold and he doesn't understand how the slave could stand the icy waters in the pond, but evidently he did su survive it. The Civil War. It is rumored that Abraham Lincoln said to Jefferson Davis, work the slaves until they are about 25 or 30 years of age, then liberate them. Davis replied, I'll never do it. Before I will, I'll wade deep in the blood. The result was that in 1861, the Civil War, that struggle which was to mark the final emancipation of the slaves began. Jeff Jefferson Davis' brother Sam and Tom joined the Confederate forces together with their sons who were old enough to go except James, Tom's son, who could not go on the account of ill health and was left behind as an overseer on the Jack Davis plantation. Jack Davis joined the artillery regiment of Captain Razor's company. The war progressed. Sherman was on his famous march. The Yankees had made such sweeping advances until they were in Robus, Robertsville, South Carolina, about five miles from Black Swamp. The report of gunfire and cannon could be heard from the plantation. Truly the Yanks are here, everybody thought. The only happy folks were the slaves. The whites were in distress. Jack Davis returned from the field of battle to his plantation. He was on a short furlough. His wife, Mrs. Davis, asked him excitedly if, if he thought the Yankees were going to win. He replied, no, if I did, I'd kill every damn nigger on the place. Will, who, who was then a lad of 19, was standing nearby and on, and on hearing the master's remark said, the Yankees ain't going to kill me because I'm, going, I, 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 I'm going, to, going to Laurel Bay, a swamp located on the plantation. Will says that what he really meant was his, that his master was not going to kill him because he intended to run off and go to the Yankees. That afternoon, Jack Davis returned to the front, and that night, Will told his mother, Anna Georgia, that he was going to Robertsville and join the Yankees. He and his cousin, who lived on the Davis plantation, slipped off and wended their way to all of the surrounding sur plantations, spreading the news that the Yankees were in Robertsville and exhorting them to follow and join them. Soon the two had a following of about 500 slaves who had abandoned their master's plantations to meet the Yankees. En masse, they marched, breaking down fences that obstructed their passage, carefully avoiding Confederate pickets who were stationed throughout the countryside. After marching about five miles, they reached a bridge that spanned the Savannah River, a point that the Yankees held. There was a Union soldier standing guard, and before he realized it, this group of 500 slaves were upon him. Becoming cognizant that someone was upon him, he wheeled around in darkness with guns leveled at the approaching slaves and halted and cried, Halt! Will's cousins then spoke up, Don't shoot, boss, we just friends. After recognizing who they were, they were admitted into the camp that was established around the bridge. There were about 7,000 of Sherman's, General Sherman's soldiers camped there, having crossed the Savannah River on a platoon bridge that they had constructed while en route from Greenspring, Georgia, which they had just taken. The guard who let these people approach so near to him without realizing their approach was court-martialed that night for being deliratory in his duties. The federal officers told the slaves that they could go along with them or go to Savannah, a place that they had already captured. Will decided it was best for him to go to Savannah. He left. But the majority of the slaves remained with the troops. They were en route to Bondswell, South Carolina, to seize Blizz Creek Fork that had been held by the Confederates. As the Federal troops marched ahead, they were followed by the volunteer slaves. Most of these unfortunate slaves were slain by bushwhackers, Confederate snipers who fired upon them from ambush. After being killed, they were decapitated and their heads placed upon posts that lined the field so that they could be seen by other slaves to warn them of what 
would befall them if they attempted to escape. The battle at Bliss Creek Fort was one in which both armies displayed great heroism. Most of the Federal troops that made the first attack were killed as the Confederates seemed to be irresistible. After rushing up reinforcements, the Federals were successful in capturing it and a large number of rebels. General Sherman's custom was to march ahead of the army and cut right, rights of way for them to pass. At this point of the war, many of the slaves were escaping from their plantations and joining the Yankees. All of these slaves at Black Swamp who did not voluntarily run away and go to the Yankees were now free by right of conquest of the Federals. 